Ruth chapter 3. <laughs> I'm going to read from verse 1 to 10, I think. And then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Now is not Boaz our kinsman with whose mates you bear? Behold, he winneth barley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash yourself, therefore, anoint yourself, put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down, and then he will tell you what you shall do. She said to her, all that you say I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz has eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, and he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain, and she came secretly and, and covered his feet and lay down. It happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and bent forward, and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maid. So spread and cover me over, put the covering over your maid, for you are a close relative. Till then, Heavenly Father, how I thank you for the time in Durban. If you have spent here 10 days, it seems like a breeze. It was gone. And Lord, and when we start, it's almost like the end is already there. And that's like our life, for oh God. We, you burst us and we burst into your purpose and burst into your plan. And before we know the Lord is coming to an end and we can no longer do the, redo these things because we have to taste and fulfill every moment of our life. And I just thank you today for his church. I thank you for Fiona. I thank you for the ministry team, for the elders, for the young people, for, for the older people, Lord, for everyone who is representing this family and this house of God. And I just ask you, oh Lord, to let the heavens be open. Lord, we, I can understand how Paul many times felt and how he longed to be with the church because the church is not an organization. The church is a people bonding hearts together for the same purpose and for the same plan. And Lord, we have the same love in our life. And I just thank you, Lord, as a matter where we are and what we are, that all of us pursue the same high calling in Christ Jesus, that we can stretch out to fulfill our destiny in our purpose. Lord, I pray this night that you will just conclude what need to be concluded in every heart and every light. It's just for this day, Lord Jesus. We have to go on and then we have to move into what you have. And I thank you for every hungry heart and for every hungry life. Breathe upon us this day. Thank you for all the love we have received, oh God, and for the for just the, the warmth of heart. And I just ask you to keep, um, keep this church in your hands, oh Lord. Lord, let it grow and let it be empowered with the power from with high, I say. Lord, bless it and let the blessing yet be upon your word in the simplicity of your spirit, I pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You know, I love the book of Ruth because the book of Ruth is, takes one little family to put it in a plan and in the life of a destiny and purpose of God. And when you look at your life and I look at my life, you can hardly fathom that all of us are born to fulfill the destiny and the purpose of God for this generation and for this time. Now, the book of Ruth is one little family actually happened in the middle of the book of Judges. And you know, the book of Judges was known for one thing, that everybody did what was right in his own eyes. And I think in these times too, if you know many of our lives, as you look at your life, we all or even look at different churches, you can see that all of us, by the revelation and inspiration, that we're doing that, what is right in our own eyes, and unless to 
the Lord comes and he squeezes us. Now, when you look at the book of Ruth, and I just want to just show you a little bit about the family, because I believe the families and the individuals are important. God has a purpose to put us together. God has a purpose to birth forth in our family's destiny and uh, brings forth the glory of God through the generations of our life. Now, when you look at the name Elimelech, means my God is king. Now, he produced two sons who are not born out of the prin- princely royal, um, what would you say, but how he's seen God and power. Because the two sons, Mahalian and Chilion, means weak and sickly. And they're actually born in a time where Elimelech could not understand what God was doing in his life. Now in a time as there's a famine in the land, you know the famine always speaks of extreme scarcity, scarcity of food, starvation, great shortages. And sometimes uh, before real famine is, there can be a famine of the revelation of the word of God. It doesn't mean I'm not talking about information. Many of us have information, but information is not revelation. Revelation is not information. Revelation is something God has to reveal in your life in a great darkness to produce light in your life. Now, in the famine of revelation... Or the famine of gifting or the famine of ministry. The famine. What happened is that many of us move in the land of Moab. Now Moab is a type of flesh. And when you look at the Moab, many things happen in Moab. It says that Moses went up to the plains of Moab and the Lord showed him the land. He never entered the land, but he saw the promised land for Moab. Now Moab speaks of a being at ease. It talks about being secure, being careless, arrogant, full of pride, trust in your own achievement and treasures. And it talks about how he said, we have heard of the pride of Moab. Now Moab, imagine Israel had famine. Moab had no famine. And you know, the Moabites had sexual liberty. And the Lord knew that every idol worship produces sexual liberty, immoralities, which will affect the thinking of, God, of the people. And you can see today many of us struggling because we're taking ourselves liberties and, uh, in our lives so that we don't know really how to walk in the purity of the Lord. Now as you look at eliminate, as he takes his two care to Two kids, his two sons, in the land of Moab, you have three, two, three funerals and two, vedi- and two weddings. And yet, you can see a stripping of manhood in the land of Moab. They're totally stripped of their sons. The, Naomi is stripped of her husband. She is stripped of her son. And she lived in Moab. In a, maybe she had enough food, but she lost her life. And she lost that, what she treasures most. Now you can see what happened. God put us always on a journey. And yes, this morning I'm talking about return. For her to be fulfilled, she had to return to Bethlehem, Judah. To the land of praise and to the house of bread. And she had to take a journey because all of us, when we are in a certain place and we move into our own ideas and our own lifestyle, there comes, you cannot please God just because you become good in your flesh. You have to allow that flesh to die and that is a journey. Now, as she comes and she's on her journey, she takes the two daughter-in-laws with her. And you know, she cries out something. The name Naomi means my delight. But she said, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Because full when they're out, but empty do I return. And in the land of Moab, a transformation had happened. She has changed from a sweet woman to a bitter woman. She has experienced disappointments and hurt and heartaches. And out of the disappointments and hurt and heartache, she had no visions for her daughter-in-laws any longer. And you see, in your, our bitternesses in our life, what does it help you? 
If you have served to God all your life long and you lost the power of impartation. Every one of us has a power of impartation, but we cannot bring impartation of life when we are maras. Bitterness. And she, she, in her bitterness, she didn't say, come on, Ruth. Come on, Orpha. There is a place for us in Bethlehem, Judah. I have a vision for you. No. She said, stay here. Orpha actually obeyed Naomi. She had no power of impartation. And you see, this is the problem. We can, if the church has no power of impartation, we have no power to impart the seed of life into the generation to bring forth the change because we cannot bring a change to persuasion. The change has to come to impregnation. And you see, I say many times when I preach, I say, how are people changed? And you know that you cannot be changed because you hear every Sunday great teaching. Some people have the greatest teaching, but they're not changed. They don't change their thinking. They don't change their habits. They don't change their lifestyle. They get released and move right into the same thing. And I realize the only way my change, David change, our change, everybody who changes comes because of impartation. To impregnation. For the seed of the word are penetrating to the hearing of the word into your life. And it was, you know what it does. Your Christy has been very sick. Now when you get impregnated, you will get sick of the very things you treasure. Impregnation. Sometimes, when I was pregnant, I loved coffee. I couldn't drink coffee for eight days. Eight, for the whole eight months. Why? Because the foods you desire, something with the life from within resents the very thing you used to love. And it's the same with the impregnation of the seed. The things you like to eat of and live of. Suddenly, when God impregnates you with the seed of his life, as you move and you return into the proper place to fulfill your destiny, you cannot fulfill your destiny in Moab. You can never experience, you have to, me too, I have to come to the house of bread, to the land of praise, to understand what God wants in our life. And you know, I realize as she comes on a journey, she has no power over, over these daughter-in-law. She wants to get rid of them. There was nothing to impart to them out of her emptiness. Now, Oprah, she turned, but Ruth stick to her, not because of vision. She just loved her. She said, whither have you used us in marriage? Whither thou goest, I shall go. Whither lodges, I shall love. Thy people shall be my people. And as they moved into Bethlehem, Judah, into the house of bread, the whole town was moved. Because here came a woman after 10 years of living in Moab. Has nothing to show. And you know how many Christians I meet? They're Christians for years, have nothing to show. Nothing. We live on the same level as the sinners. The same struggles. The same insecurities. The same sexual perversion. The same lusts. We live on the same level. And I realize, as God, what God does in our life, here she comes. And as she comes, you know, it's the Ruth, because she loves it, means a friend. The name Ruth means friend. And she goes into the fields and she becomes a gleaner. And you know, the Lord sees Ruth as she comes. She's called a Moabite. Some, somebody has a mark on her. She's a Moabite to the whole scripture. Ruth the Moabite. A Moabite could not enter into the presence of the Lord. A Moabite was an idol worship. A Moabite. And you know that she goes to the process. Ruth. The Moabite. And one day, as she serves in the field and she gleans, and Boaz said to her, stay in this field. How many times I tell people, stay in the field. Don't look for opportunities. You know how many Christians are opportunists? I know when I was young, I said, God, when am I going to use my gifting? I didn't even know what gifting I had. I didn't really think I had a gifting. But everybody spoke of gifting, so God, don't use my gifting. 
And I said, God, use me. Don't leave my life. Let my life be in vain. And I never forget it. One day, God, I was young. They said, Lord said to me, Ziggy, don't you ever look for opportunities. Because I am your door. I'm the one who's going to put you into the place and take you out of the place. Don't you ever look for opportunities. Sometimes I was tempted. But it was something. I stayed in the field. That field means in the field you get enlarged. You get never enlarged if you don't stay. If you run away, you get never enlarged. Your heart, your mind, your spirit. You, man, some of us, we love the Lord, but our hearts are so little, like a little pea. Small. We love one person. If one person hurts us, we don't love nobody anymore. Small heart. Now, how do I get enlarged? Enlargement is pain. Remember the job is there. I'm a son of sorrow. You enlarged my heart. Now, how do you think you get enlarged? That a little German girl can travel in 90 nations and left people all over. Not from the German culture. I live in the East. God stretches you. And how does he stretch you? He doesn't stretch you. You're declaring, I love the nation. No. He gives you Indian friends, Chinese friends. He reaches deep within you as you stay in the field. And the nations become people. I said, Lord, how do I love nation? He said, you don't love a nation if you can't love the people. And you see, that's just sometimes you have such fantasy. Some of us, we love Israel, but we don't love the Jews. Why? Because it's an enlargement. When you see something that you don't like and something which you don't fear, stay in the field. Stay in it. Ruth the Moabite. Stay in the field. And you see some of us, we run from opportunity to opportunity. We stay small. Our hearts are little. Our minds are little. Now how do you think you get revelation? Revelation you don't get because you need to know the root word. Some of you have great information, great teacher, but you lack revelation. Because the revelation comes out of the darkness. It breaks out of your innermost being. It breaks forth and it illuminates your lack and your want and your desire and your heart's cries. So as Ruth the Moabite stays in the field, God enlarges her. She only picks up the glean. She was not in the middle of the harvest. She was not important, but she stayed behind. And one day, Naomi became Naomi again in Bethlehem, Judah. She turned for Mara because she had a vision. And she said this to Ruth. And that's what the Lord says. The Holy Spirit comes to you and I. And then, then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, my daughter, shall I not seek security for you? That it might be well with you. Now what is the Lord speaking here? She said, my daughter, shall I not seek rest for you? Shall you not have a place where you can be at peace? Shall there not be a place where you can relax? Security, you know what security means? Fulfillment. We all look for fulfillment. Sometimes we look for fulfillment in different people. But to, for you and I to come to fulfillment... You have to go to a process. And so you have to come to a process because you don't get fulfilled because you do things from without. There has to happen things from within. Now what she say? Come on, you're going to go to Boaz. You're going to come and you're going to meet the beloved. Now you have to know Boaz. He was sleeping when in, in the threshing floor. Because on the threshing floor, the masters of, these, uh, uh, of the threshing floor, when the wheat was separated from the shaft, it was so valuable that the man who owned the wheat would sleep it because they don't want anybody to steal it. They don't want anybody to mix it. They want, a, when you go on to the process, the value of the wheat is different than before it comes be, be dressing. And you know, here's Boaz, and he's sleeping on a threshing floor. 
He's laying down in the middle of the harvest. In the process, it's not it's ready. The wheat is ready. It, because it's not enough to be wheat. The church has to become bread. And for us to become bread, there is, comes a process in our life. Because the satisfaction is not you carry the bread around. The satisfaction comes when your hunger is stilled. And you ate the bread. Now, when you carry the bread in your hunger, you can be stimulated. Your water in your mouth can throw, and you're hungry, and you want to eat it. But if you ate it, it's a different process. Your desires and your stimulation stop, stop because the bread, as you eat it, becomes fulfillment. And out of the fulfillment comes energy, and out of the energy comes youth. And you see, some of us, we don't go to the process. We just smell the bread. But we don't eat it. The word is bread. We have to partake it. And that doesn't do the same stimulation, you understand? It doesn't. What does it do when you're hungry? It gives you appetite. But when you're full, you're satisfied. Do you understand? And you see, some of us, we always stimulate it, but we never get satisfied. Stimulation without satisfaction is frustration. And today, the church is frustrated because our senses are so over-sensitized that we actually want to experience the same pleasures as we experience in our senses. Our senses. Now, when the Lord can use your senses, he's taking your natural. Just remember that when Paul was hungry, he gives him the revelation of the creepy things. And sometimes he uses your natural hunger, and your natural desire, and your natural longings to show you spiritual principles. So he can interpret it to you and me to give me an understanding of it. But. When I come and I come to the process to be fulfilled. It's not stimulation. It's fulfillment. Remember, when you have that bread in you and you are full or the meat, your meal, whatever stimulated you, it's gone, the stimulation. And you satisfied. Sometimes you're too full and you don't want to eat anymore because you're satisfied in your life. You see, sometimes the church don't know what to do with satisfaction. Our whole ministries are born out of stimulation. But the satisfaction is the thing which brings forth the fullness of Christ in your life. So for how do I come to that? He, and she gives her the recipe. She said, therefore wash yourself. What does the word do? Uh, it washes me. It washes me of my stimulation. It washes me of my uncleanness. It washes me. Remember what Jesus said. He said in, in John chapter 13 for eight to Peter. As he said, no Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. He says, what? If, you, if, you, if I don't wash you, you have no part in me. If I don't wash you the feet with water. Now, the word is a vow about the same as it is a bread. It has to wash. He said, wash yourself from what? She would have to wash herself from the widowhood. Because she came to Bethlehem, womb, Judah, not as a bride. She was a widow woman. And today, many of the church people are not brides. We're widowers. We, our mentality is shaped by the things we have lost. By her three funerals and the weddings were no joy because the, the bridegroom died and she became a widow woman. Now, what is a, the Lord is not marrying a widow woman, the church. He's marrying a bride. Now, how in the, guy, how in the world you guys are going to be brides? I ask you with your manchu ideas. And how we women are going to be bright with our fantasies and dreams. We sing, we, we, it's like one time I smuggled Bibles and I thought the Lord used me to smuggle Bibles because I've been a little smuggler since I'm small. Chocolates and so on. <laughs> and I tell you something, he stripped me 
And I realized that all my smuggle experience were nothing. Because he washed me of my past. And it's the same for all, all of us. He, what do we have to be washed of our opinions and ideas of our losses? Because what is a bride is? A bride is not a mushy, mushy. Oh, Lord, I'm the bride of Christ. And you have sentimental feeling and you're trying to drum it up. To be a bride is a mindset. Because you cannot be a bride if you don't have a bridegroom. And you know, many of us, we don't have a bridegroom. We just have a dream of a bridegroom. Now we now have a bridegroom. What happens in my life? I get to wash myself of, the, of, of my widowhood, of the things I've experienced. Because a bride has anticipation and expectation. She does not live in the last. And you see, some of us, we maybe have expectation of ministry. Anticipation of what God can do with us. But we don't know what it is to be a bride. To experience the bridegroom. Because we are widowers. We are formed in the mindset of the things we have lost. Three funerals and more up. Lost everything. And here I am gaining God. How is going to change us? Wash yourself. Because all of us. Doesn't matter what we experience. It's going to change me, my thinking. Then she said, anoint yourself. Now, then anointing is very important. I depend on the anointing. The anointing sets you free. It breaks the yoke. And you know what David did? He, many times he was anointed three times in, in official capacity. He was anointed as he was a shepherd boy. And he was anointed over the king of Judah. And he was anointed over the king of Israel. But he anointed himself. Remember how he sent with Bathsheba. And he, this child died. And he was lying on the floor in sackcloth and in ashes. Because he knew that he sinned. He was killing Uriah. And he was killing and he made Bathsheba adulteress. And it says Uriah. Bathsheba was the wife of Uriah, married to David. And as that child died, died on the seventh day, because on the eighth day it would have been circumcised, and it would have not only be a son of David, it would have been the son of Israel. And God killed him before he was circumcised, because it was a child of death and a child of sin. And as that child died, and David was lying in sackcloth and ashes. As a dead, he rose up. He washed himself. He anointed himself. And he put kingly robes on. And you need some of you, you, you maybe want to keep stuff alive. It needs to die in your heart. You hang on to sentiments and to ideas. And you cling to it. How many things I had to wash myself Things who have died in my life, friendships, dreams. And I begged the Lord to let it live. And I knew it was not a child of promise born from within. It was a child of death, of self will self-promotion and self of self. And then you have, I pursued it with such determination. What you got to do? It's dead. You cannot bring it alive. There's some things in your life you cannot pray alive. You cannot believe alive. You have to let it lie dead. And you have to get up and wash yourself and anoint yourself. Because the anointing will break the coke, the yoke. What does an anointing do? The anointing will do what? Makes a calm and thing extraordinary. Makes a calm and thing sacred. And you see, if you don't have the oil of the Spirit in your life, and allow, you don't allow that oil of the Spirit to come to illuminate your life, to anoint you, to break the yoke in your life, you will always never see what God has for you. You will always look to others. You will always dream about things which are dead. Doomed to death because they're not born of the Spirit. They're not formed of the Spirit. So David did what? He anointed himself. And as he anointed himself, he put his garments on. 
And, she, she, and Naomi said to Ruth, put on your garments. And then what she took, she took off her widowhood. So everybody could see. You remember garments in those days declared who you were. You could recognize a shepherd. You could recognize a priest. You could recognize a Levi. You could recognize a Jew. You could recognize a Moabite. Because they didn't need to say it. They didn't need to speak the language. You can recognize a Pharisee and a Sadducee because of what they were. War. But when they mourned, they all looked alike. There was no difference in their identity. The shepherd and the king, mourning makes you all look alike. It takes away your individuality. And you see, some of us, we're in constant mourning because we don't get comforted. You, God said, blessed are those who mourn so you can keep on mourning now, so you can be comforted. And what David did when he anointed himself with the oil, he comforted himself for the death of that child. And he rose up. And what did he do? You can only comfort others when you've been comforted. It says in the New Testament, in Corinthians. He said, when you're comforted and you allow the comfort of the Spirit come upon you, you can be comfort others. What does comfort mean to make you at ease? In the morning, when you mourn. How do I break that morning? I remember when we were in Russia, I think I told this here. And the Lord gave me a message and comfort. And we were in Moscow and on the Black Sea, we were speaking in a church. And I was talking about the comfort. And the women sitting all over. And many of them in the 60s and 70s. And suddenly they start crying. Been in church for years. Russia had abortions from the time from the 50s, million. Some of these women had no other birth control. Some of them have had eight abortions, sitting in church. Little woman, eight abortions. I read the life story of the Svetlana Stalin. Three abortions, two children. It was just how the Soviets did it in those days. They didn't talk about it. It was not the right. It was a forced thing upon these people. And you know, as you can see these in the Russian church for years, the uncomforted Christians could not receive the fullness of the Spirit because they didn't know how to wash themselves, how to anoint themselves, how to put on the garments. It's a new move in Russia. It's a new power in, start, it has to come in Europe and in Russia because God brings what? A new comfort in your life. So what did Ruth do? After the washing and the anointing, you've got to take off your morning clothes. You can't wrap yourself in the same sorrows of yesterday. It's not something you do. It's something you put on in your life. And then she went on a journey to find what? Fulfillment. And she comes and she lies to the feet of Boaz. And I can tell you what happens in, inside in your life when you go through that process. Many of us identify ourselves with the losses of our life on certain levels. Now here comes Ruth. Lies on the feet of Boaz, her kinsman, her redeemer. And she lies on the feet of Boaz at midnight. And he said, who art thou? And I love that. You know what she says? She doesn't say, I'm Ruth the Moabite. She has a new identity. She said, I am Ruth, your handmaiden. Cover me. Put the mantle over me and cover me. That's covering. I am Ruth, your handmaid. So the whole, you go through the whole book of Ruth and you see what God done. What did God do with Ruth? She, he used her to restore fatherhood, manhood, to bring forth the lineage of Christ out of her life. And you know, I want to encourage you. Because all our lives, all in us, 
the hungers and desires, longings. We are made like that. But all of us have to deal. Some things you're in, you have not chosen. They have chosen you. Some circumstances you've been a victim, I've been a victim. And when you have a victim mentality, somebody else has power over you that you have done things without a choice. I have not chosen where I was born. You have not chosen where I was born. I have not chosen my race. I have not chosen to be a woman. I have not chosen it. God used this. Can tell you many times when I was so little, I had always had a question. My question was, oh, why am me? Why am I me? Why am me? And uh, what makes me tick? Little like this. And I could never figure it out. Why wasn't I not born a dog? <laughs> or a goat? And sometimes I was so happy that I was not a goat. <laughs> I said, why me? I mean, that's silly, is it? But it started to search. And the hunger, maybe you have similar question. Maybe you don't ask him why I'm a goat. But why does my dad didn't love me? And why does my mother doesn't love me? And why didn't I have opportunities? And why me? Listen. Jesus Christ died for you. He does all. He feeds you. He washes you. He anoints you. He closes you. And he gives you rest, fulfillment, completion, power. And that's, it's a journey. Some of us never get it, I guess. I remember a close with this. I think I told it here, but you've probably forgotten anyway. <laughs> somebody asked me to pray for somebody I've known for many years in Johannesburg. I just arrived. I was an elder in the AFM church. Very stately man. But he never had the ability to bring forth Christ in his family. The boys were a mess. The girls felt unloved. But he was important in church. Now, we knew them because we know how it is in South Africa. When you know one family, you get to know all the relatives somehow. And this was a certain uncle from the certain people we knew. And they said to me as I arrived, would you come with me? With me because my uncle is dying. I said, sure. Known for many years. So I'm going there outside Joburg, and I go in there, and I come into the house, and there I see a guy I hardly recognize. He sits there. I never knew he had big black blue eyes. He always looked like this. Just, his face was never open, always grouchy. Loving Lord, but grouchy. And here he lost a lot of weight. He had cancer. I look. And his huge blue eyes. I said, oh, 20 years I know this guy. I never knew that he has eyes like that. Yes, closed man. And I sit there and I can see something happen. It just fits with what I spoke this morning. Something was broken in him. That cancer broke something. He had discord. The kids hated each other. The sons fought. The wife was unhappy. And it was just an unfunctional family, even so they were good people. You know how many times we are unfunctional, even so we are good people? We don't know how to reach each other. And as I sat there, they waited for me to pray for him. I said, no. I said, you know what? I'm not going to pray for you. You're going to ready to step over I'm going to ask you to pray for me. I want you to lay my hands, your hands up on me because something has happened in your life, in your sickness. Will your spirit, which you never discovered in church, something you had a revelation of who Christ is. And you know what? That I went around to his bed. I knelt in front of his bed. And I asked him to pray for me. 
He lays his hands upon me and he was praying prophetically and I never knew he was prophetically. And he spoke in Afrikaans and he spoke in English and there was a power. Now for two weeks, he lived for two weeks on this deathbed. The family reconciled, friends reconciled, things happened he could never have done in all his Christian life. Why? Because he always, he could never surrender. Always had to be right. Never. And as that cancer ravished his body, something happens in his life for what he did. Well, he washed himself because of his opinion, of his religion, of his fights. And he said to his wife, married 45 years, sorry. That I kept you, that I didn't bless you, that I never released you, that I didn't love you. Mary, that long, being in church all your life, and only in the last, what grace, in the last two weeks of his life, he washed himself, he anointed himself, he put his raiment on, and he got himself to the floor. And in the last two weeks, I believe, he done more than an old Christian life to set his family free, to infuse life. Why? Because greater is he who is within me than he who is in the world. What I'm telling you today, allow God, whatever you go through, whatever you stripped off, allow the Lord. To find you rest, fulfillment, completion. You will not get it striving. Never. We will only get it yielding as a pot of clay in the master's hand to form us and to mold us and to shape us for his destiny and for his purpose. I don't know your journey, but I know this. All of us have to return to our first love again and again and again so he can do in me and become my hope of glory and my fulfillment. I believe me, every one of you have a chance. What I am today, I have chosen yesterday and what I'm going to be tomorrow, I'm choosing today. It's your choice to give it all, to try it all, to loosen it all, or to live it more up in your widow mentality or widower mentality. But the church is a bride. The church will be the five virgin with oil and light to be able to enter, to fulfill for what Christ has died. He did not only die for my sins. He died so that he could forgive my sins. So eventually I can be like him. And I became completed in Christ Jesus through his grace and to his power. Would you bow your head with me? Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for his church. For every man and for every woman. Lord, you know our struggles and you know our fights and you know how many times the enemy comes and how he stimulates our appetites and stimulates our life. So many times when we're in scarcity, we're ready to go to the Moabites who live at ease and who have no struggle and who did not have to confront issues and who can just live our life, oh Lord, in a lifestyle for nobody cares. But Lord, we are here in the church because we have made decisions. We are here because we don't want to live in the land of the Moabites. We don't only want to stand like Moabites Moses in the Moabite land to look into the promised land and never get into it. We want to walk into it because you promised us. You promised us that you died that we might be completed in Christ Jesus. And I just thank you, Lord, that every one, every man, every woman, doesn't matter what age, that we fulfill destiny and purpose. And Lord, I pray this night that something will be born within us. 
Lord, I pray that people will make decisions and that we don't wait until our bodies are ravished and our dreams are broken. Lord, that we can make decisions now, change our life now, because we say yes and we surrender. And we take off our widowhood and we wash ourselves and we anoint ourselves and we put our garments on and we get ourselves. Lord, after we're all fresh, we just get to the floor to get it all dirty again. In our adoration. And Lord, as we lie in that heap, we ask you to cover us with your love. We ask you, O God, to cover us in our nakedness, in our barrenness, in our helplessness, in our fear. 